This video is going to be covering chapter 20, section 3, which deals with electrolytic cells. Now, electrolytic cells are similar to voltaic cells in that they use uh, redox reaction and uh, electricity, an electric current, I. However, uh, they're pretty much the exact opposite of electro or of voltaic cells, rather, in that they convert uh, electrical energy from a direct current, direct current power source into uh, chemical energy. So if we're looking at how electrolytic cells work, we first have to look at how a voltaic cell works. So we'll go back to the classic uh, zinc copper uh, wet cell that we've been using for looking at vot voltaic cells and electrochem in general. Uh, and if you'll remember, uh, in a voltaic cell, naturally the electrons will flow from the zinc across to the copper where they'll, where they'll form solid copper ions. However, in an electrolytic cell, the cathode and anode are reversed because up here you attach a uh, series of DC batteries and therefore the uh, current reverses direction so you have to switch the anode and cathode because then oxidation occurs over here on the copper and a reduction occurs over here on the zinc. Thus we can write the cathode and anode reactions as copper reacting to form uh, its ion and two electrons and the zinc in solution then receiving those ions or receiving those electrons rather to form solid zinc. So rather than building up solid copper over here, you instead build up solid zinc over here. So these are pretty much the exact opposite of voltaic cells in that these require uh, an input of energy, whereas voltaic cells output energy, as you remember, like those batteries. As well, these can cause uh, non-spontaneous reactions to occur by brute forcing the energy into them. Oppositely, voltaic cells uh, take a spontaneous reaction and output energy. So for a more specific electrolytic process, we'll now look at electroplating, which is an electrolytic process in which a metal ion is reduced and solid metal is deposited on its surface. In this case, you have solid silver here uh, dissolved, or rather, uh, in a solution of silver cyanate, with the silver ions being deposited on this poorly drawn bracelet over here. And basically how this works is that the silver uh, breaks up, the solid silver uh, breaks up into an ion in solution, as well as a uh, electron. Then the silver ions pass through the solution to complete the circuit uh, going over to uh, this bracelet where the silver ions combine with an electron that makes its way through this wire through the batteries which are forcing the electrons to go this way. Otherwise the spontaneous process would be for uh, the silver to gain metal. Uh, and then the silver is reduced over here to deposit solid silver onto the jewelry. Moving on now to rechargeable batteries. Now rechargeable batteries like the uh, lithium ion uh, batteries in your laptop or the uh, lead acid batteries that power your car work as both voltaic cells as well as uh, electrolytic cells. And this is because when they're acting as volta voltaic cells, they're discharging. In other words, they're taking their chemical energy and converting it into electrical energy. Whereas oppositely, when they're acting as electrolytic cells, they're taking their they're taking in electrical energy from some outside source. In the case of lead acid, that's from your engine. In the case of lithium ion, that's from some power plant nearby that's powering your house. Uh, they take this electrical energy input and convert it back into chemical energy, which they can then discharge as a voltaic cell 
when on the move and not connected to an outside power source. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing electrolysis. Now, electrolysis consists of passing current, in this case represented by I, through a cell with a negative potential. And this causes a redox reaction to occur. For example, if we have a solution of water which uh, is a slight electrolyte because it has you know the positive hydronium and negative hydroxide ions in a certain concentration within it and we take two electrodes poke them up through and then uh, run these electrodes connect them to a battery usually represented by these lines in schematics uh, what you'll find is that if you're careful enough to place test tubes over these electrodes is that you'll start getting bubbles that form and come up to form a sort of pocket of air in either one. And this is because what you're doing in this process of the electrolysis of water is you're breaking down the water into its constituent uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen. And this is the this is a chemical reaction. This isn't the standard redox equation, or at least not for the uh, the half reactions. But if you remember from our episode on thermochem, that uh, this actually requires energy to do. In other words, this is a non-spontaneous reaction. It has a negative Gibbs free energy value. And so what ends, or a positive uh, Gibbs free energy value. So you're taking energy from these batteries and forcing a non-spontaneous reaction to occur through electrolysis. And if you look at the two half processes, you'll notice that at the anode, you're forming the oxygen, whereas at the cathode, you're forming the hydrogen. So it is through the process of electrolysis that we actually have the cheap aluminum production that allows us to have cans and lightweight cars and whatnot that we use aluminum for every day. And this is because although there's plenty of aluminum in the Earth's crust, it's usually tied up in a compound called bauxite, which is aluminum oxide Al2O3, which is usually hydrated. Uh, plus a bunch of other compounds. So like you have probably some iron, some silica in there. And so there's a complex process known as the hull hero process to purify aluminum and get metallic aluminum out of all this other stuff that's going on. And the first step is you take the bauxite and dissolve it in a NaOH solution. And this is because only the alumina, that is what this is referred to, the hydrated aluminum oxide, will dissolve. So you can take out all the things that precipitate out or settle to the bottom as these compounds and completely eliminate those. Now from there, they dissolve it in a compound called cryolite, which if you want to know the chemical formula is Na3ALF6. And this reduces the aluminum ions in the solution because these aluminum ions come out as uh, positive aluminum ions from both the cryolite and the uh, leftover aluminum and it reduces them so you know they gain their three electrons from uh, wherever this sodium that gives them up to form solid aluminum which can then or in this case, because it happens at such a high temperature, it's actually liquid aluminum, which then falls out of solution and is then uh, collected up. And the full procedure that happens in solution is you have two aluminum oxide molecules and three carbon atoms yielding four solid uh, or liquid aluminum atoms plus three molecules of CO2. And because this Halterow process uses 5% of the total energy in the US every year, it's 
really important to recycle your aluminum cans and whatnot to save on power.